Hi, everyone. So the idea of this panel is to explore ways to identify talent by means of collaborating with educators, but also highlighting some good or inspirational practices that can help guide other studios. To then to that end, I'm joined by Reese Sandry of Monkey Stack, um, Kelly Neville and Sarah Jordan of Game Love Brisbane, Lana Kesavana from Wargaming Sydney, and David Belfour from the Australian Film, Television and Radio School. As usual, let's start with a round of intros. Reese, over to you. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. My name is uh, Reese Sandry. I'm the Executive Manager of Marketing and Partnerships here at Monkey Stack. Uh, Monkey Stack, uh, we're a, a South Australian uh, games, animation and experience studio. Uh, currently got about uh, 39 people on staff. Fantastic. David? I'm the Director of Teaching and Learning at AFTERS. That's a very long title and um, uh, and it's very important uh, to, to everyone know that we are historically the film, television and radio school, but increasingly uh, with the area of convergence, we're seeing the ability for our students to work in the games world, both in story and in production. And we train about 400 students across a BA and an MA in radio and screen production. And um, and we also have a master's of screen business, which is thinking about creative entrepreneurship and leadership in these areas of convergence. And we do about 3000 short courses across the year. We were set up in 1972 to provide graduates with high level skills and high level artistry to develop the programs um, that will help Australia flourish culturally and uh, as a, um, uh, a screen business place. Fantastic. Do you already have plans for your anniversary next year? Oh, there are many plans and they are uh, slowly, slowly coming to fruition. So uh, a variety of exciting things coming in which you hopefully invite everybody. <laughs> um, Sarah. Um, hi, so um, my name is Sarah Jordan. I'm the HR manager of Gameloft Brisbane. Um, obviously, we're part of uh, Gameloft Global. Uh, this studio has been running since 2014, uh, and we are currently going through a very exciting uh, expansion uh, in our in our studio, uh, largely as a result of the uh, tax incentive that has been. <laughs> Um, provided now to the digital industry uh, within Australia. So that's very exciting news for us. Um, and I will hand over to Caddy now because Caddy is the person that's been helping us with our expansion plans. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, my name's Caddy Neville. I'm the talent acquisition partner for Gameloft Brisbane. Um, so I've got about 15 plus years across agency um, and in-house. Um, so when I joined the team, um, had the opportunity to work with Sarah uh, to scale up. Um, I was really excited. So basically, we're tipping just over seventy at the moment, um, and yeah, and and growing. So we're all, yeah, really looking forward to to the next twelve months. Thanks. Fantastic. Well, glad to hear that our work has an impact on your studio growth. Sorry, definitely. <laughs> um, and last but certainly not least, Lana. Hi everyone, I'm Lana Kirsanova, I'm HR Director at Wargaming Sydney. Wargaming Sydney is a part of Wargaming, so it's a global AAA uh, game development company. Uh, you may have heard about uh, one of our uh, biggest games, uh, which is called Little Tanks. In Sydney, we are currently working on a, a new uh, title, a uh, Wargaming title, and we also um, um, have been interested in uh, creating uh, tech for games. Um, the studio uh, Wargaming Sydney was acquired um, back in time in 2012 by Wargaming. So previously we were known as Big World, so and we built an engine, which is it was called Big World Engine. <laughs> and yeah, so since that time, uh, lots of things changed, and now we uh, we do uh, lots of uh, game development as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you for your round of intros. All right, well, let's get into it. Reese, let's start with you, and let's start with your collaboration with CDW Studios, which was mm -hmm. also supported by the South Australian government. What's the story there, and how did that help to close skill gaps in your studio? Um, it, it, look, it's, a, it's, it's quite a complex story. I'll try and give you the, the abridged version uh, for here, but look, we identified, um, uh, and we identified through, through <clears throat> we went out, 
and we've done this two times now uh, in terms of running courses to find talent and, and collaborating with, I guess, education partners or, or RTOs or, or people that can provide training, more set up for training than we are. And essentially, we uh, we, we won the contract on, a, on an animated series uh, with a US broadcaster and we needed to scale up quite quickly. Um, so we needed to, to find about 15 new 2D animators. And there's not a huge industry uh, for 2D animation in Australia. Mm-hmm. It's quite tentpole in terms of series. And so... Yeah. There's a there's a very much a a bunch of studios that that vie for projects and talent and and I guess the aim uh, or our aim and hopefully it's a collaborative aim is to to build an industry in Australia so that the talent can at least stay within within Australian borders. Um, so what we did is uh, we we went out to the, the government and we said, look, um, we're looking to to run a, a course with CDW. We went to CDW, of course, first um, and, and said, we want to, to train some people in, in industry pipeline um, uh, 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 practices. So not so much the, the, the skills of how to animate, but more, more about the practice of work like how work works, uh, which is what we found with a lot of university graduates that come through. They're very good at doing their own portfolios, not particularly good at working out how it works between nine to five in a, in a studio environment and how that pipeline actually works. So we, we put together a, a, a four-week uh, a, a course outline um, with CDW and we took our two senior uh, animation producers that would be working on the project and used them as the lecturers. Um, so then we approached the government saying, we've got this course outline, we'd like to work with CDW who are set up to do all of this training. And we've got the two senior lecturers uh, that, are, that are going to put it in, here's the cost for it. And the government, to some extent, scratched their head and said, we're not exactly sure how this fits. <laughs> um, and they, they weren't sure how it fits because it doesn't fit into a traineeship. It doesn't fit into an apprenticeship. It's not seen as a trade. Um, and it's kind of seen as something that the tertiary institutions should take care of. Mm. And we've identified, as I said, this is the second time that we've done this. Um, so we, we, we had a, uh, uh, we put a grant application in for a thing called a training priority project. Uh, and that was knocked back and forth for about a month. And we were coming up to a course and uh, it was actually um, at that point, they were like, we're not exactly sure where to place this. And so two weeks out from the course, it wasn't subsidized. And we had about five people, five applicants for it. Uh, two weeks before the course started, the government, uh, uh, when uh, we understand it and we can do it as a pilot project. Um, so it's, it's not a particular thing of training. It's, it's done as a pilot to discover what the training uh, is required. And uh, within that two weeks, we had a hundred applicants. Um, so that's, uh, I guess, the impact of, of subsidy of courses, um, especially for people coming through through tertiary institutions. The minute that it can be subsidised from a from an almost like vocational education point of view, because that's what we're teaching, um, it became a very, very popular course. Um, from that, and I've got some statistics that, or some data on it, we had um, 28 people go through uh, the course. We had three of them that were remote. Um, from that course, so the 31 people, we actually had 30 applicants. Uh, for the positions that we had and we ended up um, hiring 11 people directly from the course and about four or five of them from uh, outside of that and just general applications. Can I ask a question in there? Yeah. Of the people that you, um, that's so fascinating. It's so, so connects to so many things that, are, 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 that I've experienced as well is, you know, it, and, and what you try to do at Aftris is train people to work in the, in the work that's out there, that, that how to work in an environment. The people that you obviously you were fortunate enough to hire eleven of the people. What happened to the other nineteen? Have they gotten jobs? Have they gone? Have you tracked that in any way? I'm not expecting you to to track that, but just wondered. I, I believe that there has been a certain amount of success um, in terms of that they've been able to add this onto their CVs. So, so not only do they have a portfolio, and and a lot of portfolios that come out of tertiary look the same. Um, yeah. because they all do the same kind of things. And, and what this did is that it opened them up to, to different pipelines and a different kind of portfolio material and a different kind of uh, uh, skill set that they could place on their, their CVs. And, and it, is, it is very, very relevant because I think a lot of the, uh, the studios around that do 2, 2D animation not as big as us went, this is wonderful. There's 20 people out there who are skilled in industry pipeline and they're looking for jobs. Um, so I, I, I believe that, a decent number of them did actually get positions in the in the months after the course. 
So part of it is making sure that there's a a, a way to demonstrate people have under, like without industry experience, they understand they can actually be, are job ready, right? That's mm-hmm. the that's the that's the challenge you're trying to meet, right? Yes, yeah, and and to give you like just some some feedback, you know, the the course att- we actually took feedback on the course attendees, and it was things like this was the perfect bridge from university to industry, or learning in detail about the animation pipeline and workflow is an experience that university did not provide, um, and and. I understand that because they're universities, they're not industry. Um, uh, what we're trying to do from a, from an industry building point of view is to just bridge that gap so that industry has a little bit more of an impact on the tertiary curriculum or the, the vocational curriculum, especially in that 12 months before people are becoming employment ready. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, another studio that collaborated with a government agency, namely Screen Queensland, is Game Loft. And you did that in the context of a um, talent development initiative in the form of an internship program. So how did that work and, and what did it entail? Um, Correct. Sarah yeah. Kim. Okay, so um, we were actually approached by Screen Queensland um, uh, back in early 2021. Uh, and they let us know that they were uh, kindly helping to, you know, willing to support us with two internships. So that was very fortunate. And uh, they said, look, um, to a large extent, we you can choose the people you want. And so we went out to advertise. Um, we put the advert out as, um, you know, could be production, art, design, programming. Um, we would take all applications. Um, we obviously received a, a vast number of applications um, and uh, then we worked through those with the directors and we were able to appoint um, not only uh, an intern in the art team, uh, but also one in our design team. Um, and um, they've basically, um, they were, you know, very well, they, they were actually very well networked within the games um sort of industry locally anyways, uh, but still nonetheless, um, you know, the, the work that they put forward demonstrated their passion uh, for games. Uh, and we've appointed them now and they've uh, gone on to be um, permanent employees within the team. So um, very much that that partnership at that time um, has been really successful. Um, and we, yeah, um, I mean, that was just the start of us starting to look at, we hadn't had interns for a number of years, um, and in fact, we knew that within our internal structure, we were very senior based. Um, and so we've now very much turned that around now with our expansion plans. We've gone from 35 people to, as Katie said, just over 70. And we've really wanted to grow, um, grow our talent internally um, because, you know, that's just make, makes sense uh, where we are strategically at the moment in Australia. Um, so certainly, yeah, um, Screen Queensland, that was a successful um, project. Um, we don't have any plans to continue in a partnership with them at the moment as it stands, um, but we have had another uh, partnership that we've gone into with, um, uh, well, based outside of QUT, but I might let Caddy talk to that more a little bit later. Mm. So that, or I can, I can, we can talk to it now if you like, Jens, that's in relation yeah, to absolutely. our game jam. Yes, please. So do. we had a, so we had a, um, a game uh, it was actually the the brain uh, child of our uh, Andre, our technical director, um, who who uh, had come up with the idea and the concept. Um, mm-hmm. And then Andre worked very closely with uh, Liz, our art director, and Kelly to bring it together. So I'll let Kelly explain uh, how they worked on the game jam and what the outcome of that has been. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, this is this is hugely exciting because I think. Um, Obviously, uh, you know, Game have a have a strong relationship with with QUT, um, Queensland University of Technology, and so um, you know, a lot of our senior um, our directors, um, leads go there and review capstone projects for the students. So this kind of made sense. So the, I guess the beginning of it was really, um, yeah, Andre thought about how can we um, 
how, you know, what sort of things can we do to be able to work um, with the universities or, you know, with junior um, applicants and just help them, you know, develop the talent to help them into studios. So um, basically the game, game Jam, the purpose or the objective really was to, um, you know, open up our intern graduate, you know, program for 2022. Um, and it was across a multiple disciplines, but mainly um, 3D, tech art um, and programming. So um, I guess we, you know, Andre obviously worked really hard on the on the theme. Um, it was actually a reimagination of, a, of an '80s volleyball game, which um, and that you know was really, I think, I guess um, that took a little bit of time to to make sure we got that right. Um, and then yeah, we went out to QT. So we basically they hosted it for the weekend. So it was across Saturday, Sunday. Um, we had um, a lot of our leaders there um, helping them, um, the students with tips and tricks. Um, we ended up having 20, um, you know, 20 applications. And so we actually partnered, um, they had the opportunity to go solo or in the team of two, which was really good. Um, and I guess the, the point was that we were hoping that they were, would um, go into a team of two because we, there was definitely an art and a programming side to it. So that was quite important. Um, unless the applicant obviously had both skills and then they, there were some people that were solo and did really well. Um, so we had uh, part of the competition um, was that we would have the first prize was to offer an internship or two if it was um, you know, in partnership and then we would have vouchers for second and third. Um, so, yeah, after the weekend, all the games were uploaded um, really successfully, thank goodness, um, and then reviewed. And then the following Monday we had the awards in our um, studio, which was really cool and I guess an opportunity for the students to come and check out the studio. Um, some of them had already been there because it's something that Game Off do quite um, often with our QT students. And so I guess the other objective was really, um, you know, for the students that didn't didn't win, obviously, not, you know, the opportunity was so they could actually add, this was their IP, they added it to their portfolio and they could share that um, and own it. And also the, there was opportunity for feedback um, for them throughout the weekend, um, opportunity for me to talk to them about portfolios, what they're missing, you know, those, that sort of that gap. Um, but, yeah, so we had a really successful um, awards little um, ceremony during the day, which Sarah was really helpful to help me um, get get up. And then, yeah, we presented the, um, the internships um, to oh. two people. And they're actually starting with us tomorrow. Um, tomorrow. <laughs> so that's really <laughs> Oh, yeah, they're so, so pumped. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's the start of a really successful initiative, which we'll definitely, um, which I'm sharing with the, the broader Game of family globally um, tomorrow night, actually. So we're hoping that, yeah, other years we'll, we'll be doing the same thing. Mm. Um, and um, so that's one joining our programming team and one joining our art team tomorrow. Um, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, Caddy, but were there students from other universities in the Game Jam competition? Yeah, as absolutely. well. So yeah. UQ was represented. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that was a big thing. And QT, you know, obviously they were there to, to host, um, but very much on board with opening up to to every everyone. So when we did the advertising, it was advertised through all different universities, SAE. Um, SAE, yeah. Yeah, a lot of other. And then it was, you know, on LinkedIn and that sort of thing. So it was really open to anyone. So it was a, there was a little bit of a variation of, of applications, which was good. Mm. Um, or a couple of exciting initiatives, micro qualifications, internships, um, studio run game jams. Um, Lana, you work as a HR director in one of Australia's largest studios. What initiatives have you undertaken to, um, or in collaboration with educators, to funnel talent into your studio? What's can you give us your perspective? Yeah, uh, sure. Yes. Um, our journey. Started probably five years ago, so this is when we realized that would be would be great to have uh, uh, more uh, juniors on board. So at that time, very senior heavy, and when we spoke with our seniors, so they wanted uh, to uh, mentor and call juniors, and we also wanted to keep a go with that. So um, uh, we did a pilot. So, and we run it exactly the same way as we hire uh, all our employees. So we advertise it on the web um, and uh, we received uh, lots of uh, applicants. So it was, uh, I think from memory, it was like 50 or 70 applicants uh, per job. Um, so we had three interns at that time. So it was two engineers from memory and uh, maybe it was even three engineers from memory. 
Anyway, so the program was a huge success, and uh, this is when we learned that uh, we can have interns, and the interns for our size duty was good, so it wasn't overwhelming for our engineers, so it was perfectly fine. So, and at the same time, we were quite excited that it went so um, fantastically well. So next time we hired six, and this is where uh, it was a bit too much for us to do this. So we realized that we definitely need to consult with our team to make sure that they can meet all the commitment that they have. Uh, and the number of interns uh, have it depends on uh, our team's uh, commitments and deliveries. So currently we have between three and four interns uh, per intake. Uh, and we also make adjustment uh, each time when we hire interns. Um, to give you an example, so um, at some point when we hired interns, so we realized that um, interns, when you the only intern in a team, it feels lonely. So this way you need to put uh, interns in small groups together with the other interns, so they can hang out together and um, they're going through onboarding much easier and they have a really good experience. So another one is when we went to, when it was COVID, so we needed to make adjustments in our programs. So we uh, redesigned our program and we ran it as a semi-virtual uh, program. So when uh, our managers and uh, interns parties and interns were in the office uh, one day per week, and for the onboarding week and the last week as well, uh, which they found uh, extremely valuable for them. So being in person and um, um, learning things and teaching things so much easier to be in person. And then the next program, uh, when it was the second lockdown, so we realized that we can't do semi-virtual programs anymore, so we uh, needed to convert it into a completely virtual program, so, which we did successfully. So this one, we realized that um, for especially virtual internship programs, uh, communication is the key. So um, at some point we uh, implemented the rule for all our interns, uh, it's called minutes rule, which means that if you can't solve a problem uh, during 20 minutes, ask them. It worked fantastically well, so, and this is like an uh, improvement that we, uh, we do uh, we did uh, over the time. So it took us five years, but I think we're in a good shape right now. Our conversion rate from interns to permanent employees is 65%, which is great. And uh, even like, I mean, we see the success. So if you get a permanent job, fantastic, that's great. Uh, if you didn't, so maybe you, uh, you're you not ready to uh, work on a permanent basis, maybe you want to come back to study. So, but anyway, it's a great experience for our interns moving forward. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, that is a very high rate. Is that also the result of your selection process? I and mean, you mentioned earlier that you essentially treat interns similar to other employees. So is, is the process very selective, getting interns on board? Yeah, so our process is, uh, is I would say, um, not intense, uh, but uh, it requires, a few, it has a few stages. So we currently receive between 50 and 100 applicants per role. So, and uh, all our interns, so the first, the first step is reviewing our uh, uh, resumes. And this is where it's important to make sure that uh, if, like, let's say, if you're on zone and you're applying for a job, uh, make sure that you put all your uh, knowledge and experience on the CV. But the first step for us is to match uh, the job requirements against the uh, resume that we receive from our applicants. And then uh, we ask uh, selected candidates uh, to complete a uh, test for uh, designers and engineers. And after that, based on the test results, so we run face-to-face -face interviews. So yeah, we select the, the best candidates. Uh, and uh, for those who want to receive feedback, for example, if they uh, came second, so we always provide feedback to make sure that uh, they have a good shot uh, next time with us or not with us, uh, but I think it's important. After this long collaboration with other screen industries, do you maybe have some examples where AFTA's um, assisted with facilitating talent into um, into other studios? And you know, are there maybe examples from other screen industries, film, television, animation, that could serve as a bit of an inspiration to to the games industry? I think you know it's great to see all the conversations that we're having so far and, and the initiatives, and it's really interesting to you know hear where the gaps are. Um, mm. In that regard and we've actually over lots of different 
areas because we cover from radio through to you know traditional screen um thinking about working with industry to to develop talent pools and and streams of capacity so there's a couple i, I want to highlight one is um we have a, a long-standing um and actually there's two ways of thinking about it there's our award course programs which are our ba or ma um uh, but then we also have to sort of more, more spoke um uh schemes often with the state agencies but also sometimes to a targeted need so a few years ago we did um a program called she shoots which is there is identified um uh lack of opportunity for female cinematographers so it's taking women cinematographers who uh, reach a certain point and then enabling them to uh have a intense training period and mentorship then into further work now obviously the screen industry screen production tv and film production is very different it's it's more single purpose vehicles people pop up the production happens and it goes away again so actually helping students navigate that career is a very distinct and different series of propositions than navigating the rigors of a, a, a job where people coming regularly um so in the radio t- world which is kind of similar and somewhat to the games world and there's there's a jobs there's things there's output there's pipeline um we've done lots of work in thinking about developing um deep relationships where placements happen where students are working in authentic environments where they're not just developing the concepts and the skills because those are the foundational stuff but they're also developing that interpersonal work practices and being able to dist- and we bring industry in to our conversations at every point um and so those are some really powerful ones and we've got um uh, uh we've also had some uh, uh back in the days where there was a um uh um uh a more uh before the streamers took over the, when there was a, a really strong network of um pay, pay pay channels we had a deep relationship with what's called astra which was the foxtels the disney's the um discoveries where we had a pipeline channel and conversations with them we did a bit of a combination of um internship and then work placement and then integrated their projects and briefs into our curriculum so it was a kind of a kind of a bit of a blending that you would actually say well here's the thing we're doing with you know but here's a live project that we're working on and that live project mentality actually now infects all of our courses where students work on live briefs from industry and the industry come and not just look at the output but also look at the workflows and get comment on the workflows because uh, to what, what what everyone's been saying is actually how do you prepare to n- negotiate the world where you are a creative but a creative within a particular series of output requests right you are abs- we want people to be their fantastic selves but also we want them to be employed um because 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 actually if they're employed they're being able to generate um Teresa's point to make sure that we have a stable and expanding powerful industry in Australia both in 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 the games sector um, and, and we need that by keeping talent here. So we need to have pipelines for new talent. And I know it's increasingly hard for companies to establish. I mean, it's amazing the work that you're doing in Gamesloft, having a sort of uh, a, 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 um, a, a, with, with a, a, the, the process you're doing about the, the competitions and the placements and stuff. That's fantastic. And again, in uh, in, in Sydney, the the, the the internships. And it's I, but some of the smaller companies very, find it very difficult to run internships and that training in the way that it used to be. And so how can higher education help prepare those students and work in partnership with that? So we are, we're very excited. We've done the, um, this last year with the ABC and with um, a couple of other studios, um, smaller organizations, we're placing students there to find them to, you know, um, with a, a couple of small documentary companies in Canberra and Sydney, finding ways that we can bridge them into industry and support those students in those particular periods where they're learning how to navigate the world of work and it's, uh, that was a sort of slightly long tangent conversation but there's lots of more but i think actually what i'm what i want to end on is there's more work to be done uh, and, and i think and i think what's really interesting is maybe pick up the conversation on micro crediting is does that actually um it, it, what tool can that be used that's what, what that tool how can it be used to really help drive output for industry but also employment outcomes for students was saying because i mean it's such a great example of companies saying well look you know here here's the skills gap here's what we're going to do about it here's how we're going to collaborate with the government to support us i mean Reese, what sort of advice would you have for studios that may want to consider doing this type of collaboration where should they start um 
Well, I, I think you need to have the need for it in the, in the first place. Um, and, and, and I think to a certain extent, you know, it's, it's from, from our point of view, uh, it's, it's industry participation. Um, it's, it's identifying that you are a player in the industry, that your studio has a place and, and that the, the staff that you employ or the, the staff that you have employed or the staff that you're looking to employ, that, that they will form an important place of the industry and be the future leaders in the industry as well. And, and so I think from our perspective, um, you know, we, we, we do all the usual things. We've got, you know, a good social media community. We've got good digital platforms. We've got really, really good ways for people to contact us. Um, but what we've found is is that you know we have a very diverse studio here, and and you know from a from an animation point of view, whether it's two D or three three D, really the, the 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 people that we're looking for are, are like shy actors. Um, that's that's essentially what animators are. And so while we have all of these ways that people can communicate with us, we find that that just the the, the, the makeup of our industry, um, quite often people are timid to approach a studio or, or they're not sure whether or not they're, they're good enough. And so the industry participation of us going out and saying, look, we are looking for people and we can help you and we can identify uh, ways in which we can get you from where you are into our studio and, and very much an open arms kind of approach in terms of being very generous with our time and and um, uh, the time that we spend in collaborating with other industry partners and with government and and with ed education to to make sure that you know if as we increase the demand of, of work in Australia that we actually have the people here to service it and that those people feel wanted and um, uh, uh, very much looked after not that they're just wondering where to go you've had in the conversations with government in in mm. terms of them not not quite getting it you know due to you um, approaching sort of a micro qualification approach mm -hmm. um something that you know sits quite uncomfortable in the australian qualifications framework um how did those conversations go like what made them see the light eventually um uh, i guess to a certain extent the, the government and this is not a pejorative statement but they they cycle and, and so the people within the government cycle through and, and it goes on a three or a four year cycle and, and, and sometimes states and, and federal can be out of step. Um, uh, essentially, the, the, the micro-credentialing and, and our description of it and the, the industry demand is, is slightly, I guess, more agile um, than what the government can can act um, and and they 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 do have you know there is a vote at the end of the decisions that they make typically um, and and so from from our perspective it was it was a matter of stepping them through that there was there was an economic benefit at the end of this um, and that the economic benefit at the end of it was was greater than the expense of doing it um, and 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 that I guess we extrapolated it out and go well there is an expense at running the course but that means that that person will be employed and we are looking to employ them for this amount of time and then they're industry prepared and there are all of these other opportunities within locally and nationally and internationally in which those skills can be applied. So it was about um, educating the, 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 the current people who are making the decisions, who might not have been the same people that were making those decisions 12 months ago. I guess this is a question that goes out to to the uh, to the whole panel. Does anyone else does anyone else have some advice in that respect in terms of their their collaborations? Like, what's what's the hardest part in, for example, running um, a game jam? For example, is it a matter of resourcing? For um, for example, that that um, you know may be a challenge to smaller studios. Yeah, good uh, good question. I there were actually a few a few challenges. Um, Honestly, I think the beginning, the first challenge was really getting the right timing. Um, so that's something that, um, you know, obviously because it does take a lot of time out of, um, you know, um, project deadlines and milestones. And then for the students, of course, they, you know, they're often cramming around exams. So making sure that, yeah, we get that timing right. Um, in terms of resourcing, one of the, one of the first keys that um, we started to look at was we were going to do an online game jam just because, we didn't know how many people we would have. We wanted to make sure that it was, you know, equal and open to everyone. Um, but look, what we found was at the end, um, we've 
with 20 applications is still good, but it wasn't a huge number. And, you know, therefore we, you know, were able to partner. So I actually don't think there's too many barriers to setting something like this up, even for smaller studios. I think it's something that everyone, you know, could look at. And, and at the end of the day, um, you know, it is, is helping our students to get that, that extra information or those projects on their portfolio. So it's, um, you know, hugely helpful. Um, yeah. work with smaller studios or is it is it resource intensive to a point where that would be a challenge for them oh, well sorry yes. oh sorry I, I, I miss your beginning of the, of the question i thought it was for me <laughs> <laughs> so this, this one was for lana so um mm -hmm. yeah like like i said um you know your your uh, approach to internships is that something that smaller studios could replicate as well is that a bit do you think that would be a bit too resource intensive for them I think that it would be easier, uh, e easy to replicate for smaller um, studios. So what we are doing, because the way how we uh, design our internship programs is basically how you do any recruitment. So you advertise for a role and then you uh, evaluate uh, candidates. What's important in this uh, case is to make sure that uh, you know what the requirements or expectations you have uh, on the terms. In our case, we treat our interns the same way as we treat our juniors, and they work full time. So um, we have expectation on the deliveries, on their performance, and so on. And this is what's important when you want to run internship programs. So make sure that um, you understand what exactly what outcomes you expect out of it. And another point that I didn't mention before, but I think it's uh, it's important to mention, uh, we have a need uh, to have uh, internship programs. So, and this is where we were thinking about how we can reach out to students, to our potential candidates. So we reach out to several universities. So we collaborate uh, and we partner with a few um, engineering and design uh, societies at UNSW and um, Sydney Uni um, to make sure that um, like we can reach out to our students. So we uh, attend events uh, with students. So we talk about students, we uh, uh, provide uh, not only advice, but also we do external uh, mentorship for the students to prepare them to work uh, in the industry, uh, which is, I believe, is important. We also organize like a studio visits, uh, which is quite successful in money. So like, for students being in the studio talking to experts and actually seeing what we do is extremely valuable and it's very um, insightful in a way as well. So that's a few points. So collaborating with the university is um, a bit uh, another good thing to consider. Was saying you know there is this sort of collaborative approach there you know you got to position yourself as a player as someone who is approachable is open to collaboration mm -hmm. um Reese, when we um met um to um discuss this panel yes. um you use this this uh, tool borrowing metaphor um you know in the context oh yes <laughs> <laughs> can, can we can we go into that in a bit more detail you can if you have to borrow a piece of gardening equipment from me twice then i'm going to ask you to buy it yourself um <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, look, uh, we as I said, we've run pilot programs, and and they start off, you know, training priority projects, or, or they start off sort of trying to fit within a, a traineeship or an apprenticeship or an intern kind of program, and and because they're sort of known skill sets, you know, it's, it's, it's in terms of the way that those programs are set up for more, I guess, traditional skills. And and so when you're looking at at creative industry skills or screen based skills or digital skills, you look at these training priority projects and you go. Where does it fit? Does it fit into, into this in terms of the, the skills that would be acquired? And what we found is that it, it feels like it does until the point of, of where it's going to actually be ratified and funded. And then it doesn't because it doesn't give them uh, necessarily, it doesn't provide the outcomes which, which are, um, that people are used to in terms of, uh, you know, an apprenticeship of becoming a bricklayer or a plumber or, 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 or a more um, physical industry. Um, so they end up being trialed as pilots and, and the, 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 the pilot ends up being a, um, uh, a, a, to develop a proposed plan about how further training content could be refined and how, and how it could be, uh, how it could be adapted. And we've run these, as I said, a number of times. And what we're hopeful for is that, that over time that the, the government or tertiary institutions will, will identify 
these pilots keep on getting run. Maybe we should actually look at what the curriculum is and maybe we should include that um, because we're sort of doing that, that research um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a matter of that we just have to. Um, so, the, so the data is available that there is an industry need. We had 100 people saying, we want to do this kind of training. Um, we were only able to, to uh, give that training to 30 people because we're, a, we're, we're industry. Uh, we're, we're not, not as big as, as, as government or, or education. Does that answer that question for you, Jen? <laughs> yeah, no, it does. Yeah, um, yeah. David, from an educator's perspective, does, does that ring a bell? Is, it, that's, is that something you can relate to? So, and a little bit, but also not so much, because I guess we're a bit different at afters. Um, I think the, the metaphor of, uh, uh, you know, one of the complex things around offering courses, and, and this is a, to take a slightly different lens, is we've often asked industry what they want and what they think the skills are. And oftentimes, um, Barring your example, Reese, a lot of students don't necessarily want to pay for that because they don't understand about the creative journey, right? Like, like they have the deception of where they want to go, right? Um, and so, so our experience is actually conducting courses where actually, how do you convince that this is the right thing to be doing? And it's amazing that you were able to do that. And and I think probably you, you, the fact that it was you as a company, as an organization, so people can see employment outcomes of it. You know, I think that's where partnerships need to work with industry is because if historically people don't look to education for that thing His, they actually want um it, having a partnership in that process actually makes it a compelling offering i think that's where it can come out um i think what's interesting in there is also um from my point of view dealing with some state agencies and, and particularly in the the fe space um the the rto packages are really quite restrictive i have found um, and so we uh, have also been you know, looking to do skills training and updating, but actually managing that space has been more challenging because it is not a dynamic fluid space. So we don't have a regulatory environment or structure frameworks that actually has the dyna dy dynamism built into it. So um, the, I think that's actually what needs to happen at a, 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 at a state level, but also at a national level is like, how do you build in dynamism into a framework? I think what will be really interesting, and I know that they're thinking about funding some level of microcrediting, I think that could build dynamism because short courses alone um, are for people who can afford them, which is, that was your point, your five versus your hundred, right? I think that was your, your particular analogy. Absolutely. Yep. And I think, I think, I think without that, um, I think we're always going to have a problem. I think what was interesting in some of the COVID responses, I think people offered up a lot of money to do specific short-term training, but then they couldn't spend the money because of the structures that existed in the, the RTO packages. I, I had several conversations, like, we want to do this thing. It's like, yeah, but actually you're going to require us to do all this other stuff, but actually that doesn't meet the immediate skills need or medium-term skills need, actually, because these things don't, you know, you know short-term is um, too short-term sometimes. Um, so that, that's what I'd say is we can look at if, if we can work as an industry and education partnership to change the dynamic landscape, uh, of uh, then we can actually have better partnerships, I think. Can, uh, I, can I just add something onto that? And, and it's the, the thing about the, the employment outcome here and, and what we've sort of in, in that, that convincing state agencies or, or talking to, to broader industry about creative industry skills or screen-based skills is that the employment opportunity is not necessarily just around entertainment. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that when you can look at the diverse application of creative industry skills and, and they talk about digital literacy in a whole lot of other things that do fit within the training apprenticeships model, uh, traineeship and apprenticeships model, that that as digital starts to to and, and continues to go into those industries, that there's more of an acceptance of of um, the diverse application of what we what would normally be applied into to entertainment being applied into defense or being applied into manufacturing or, or or other industries and i think that then means that the training becomes more economically viable to back because there's more economic benefit that can be gained from it yeah and i think it's i think that's where interestingly we've had some conversations with future learns, et cetera, so those things. You can actually pull data on skill sets across, like you can look at job. This is where it's hard to do individually, but actually if you can partner with, we can pull data like, well, here's the skill sets being asked for across, you know, we've had animation graduates work at the police or at um, NASA or, you know, the various different really cool places that you wouldn't think the natural skill set for their, you know, his, 20 years ago, our animators wouldn't think about working in games. Exactly, right? exactly. yeah. 
and now they'll probably have the most you know some of them say graduate and they'll have the most fulfilling exciting you know um innovative career because they were in that area of convergence mm, yeah yeah absolutely and some really good points you brought up there david as well with regards to frameworks and that's something we've explored in last year's education summit the difficulties of sometimes um working within those frameworks and having to adhere to them and uh, you know for example how long it takes to change a learning outcome um, you know, in, in a cause. So, you know, I think there's there's a bit of a inherent friction in that. Look, there's there's one more thing I wanted to explore. Um, a lot of the initiatives that we've been talking about are, you know, aimed at um, mostly uh, junior talent. I think that's fair to say. Um, given the um, lack of senior talent and the demand of it in the Australian games industry um, currently, what are some measures that we could take to, to support the training of, of mid-level um, staff and, and you know um, bring them up to a, to a senior level. What are some potential initiatives we, we we could do there? Which you know I think is is a very loaded question given in high demand they are, but maybe do you, you have some thoughts on that? I mean, I, 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 while everyone sort of gathers their thoughts, I might sort of talk about this because this is one of the big things that I think about quite a lot. Is we've got how do we accelerate people within businesses? And I think. Um, some conversations I've had with major studios in the games and other places, they're they're noticing that actually that that senior level talent isn't coming up. And I think there's a couple of things. One, maybe where education can spark is you know offering courses around um, uh, mentorship and leadership and 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 developing those capacities, at, at not specifically within the company, but as a skill set for the individuals. Um, our screen business course really speaks to to look at where students are going and and navigating that i think that's a really a powerful and um, accelerator for the self it's a bit of a screen business mba and we screen in an absolute lateral sense um and it's about financial literacy management organizations dealing with people working in complex environments working in a dynamic uh, industry which means always changing never the same and looking for how to spot opportunities and develop the capacity to think about opportunities um and a, what we've noticed with our graduates in that space, uh, and even people who haven't, who are in mid-course, is that they're able to to see their companies, organizations in a different perspective. So often, when you're in a company in an organization, you have um, uh, a bit of a bubble. But actually, that that extra perspective is like, okay, my organization sits in a landscape of other organizations, which sits in a landscape of other things, and that that sheer simple shift in perspective actually can unlock a whole bunch of anxieties and 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 opportunities that people see. Anyway, that's my that was my filling in to let everyone else have a, have a moment of thinking. I was I was just going to add, um, Ian, because I mean we've I mean we've just gone through this huge scale up, and we've you know onboarded. 20, 30 juniors. I mean, sorry, I should know the exact numbers. Um, but and, and so that's great. But we are we've reached a, a bit of a tipping point where it, it just wouldn't be fair to bring on any more juniors at this point because there's just not enough um, you know senior people to support and mentoring and that sort of thing. So we are doing um, quite a good piece at the moment. I know Sarah's working um, quite hard on a, some training programs and, and yeah. offering yes training. So I might Thank take you, sure. to, Sarah to to talk through that. Yeah. So, yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, recognition of the ability for critical thinking as well um, is something that we're really uh, seeing a need to encourage that within our new team members um, and broaden on that. But, yeah, absolutely leadership. And I agree looking at the framework of work um, rather than this very sort of polarised view that they may have. Um, and starting to recognise the impact, as you say, of, um, you know, thinking about the, the financial, you know, the financials of running a business and looking at the wider industry. That's really important for their development to understand. Um, yeah. You know, and understand the, the history and where we are now in the industry and, and really um, to help to, to form where they are in it now and future state um, and to develop their communication skills is, is critical really, um, collaboration um, and recognising, you know, there are some people uh, inevitably who have, you can see those natural skills are there, um, looking to develop those, but also assisting, um, as you say, the shy actors, um, of which there are many, um, to, to recognise that it's, um, it's really going to be a crucial part of their development, their ongoing career.
initiatives to um, facilitate senior talent? Yeah, it's a, um, I, I was thinking about that, like um, progressing pro, progress from a junior level to mid-level is relatively easy. Um, so it normally takes for people like between six months to 12 months. Uh, so the progressing from mid-level to senior level is, uh, yeah, it's a bit more complicated. So it takes more time. And um, thinking about any courses or program that will speed up this process, I, I can't find that. I, I can't see it, honestly speaking. So I think that mentorship overall is good. Uh, and it can be any type of uh, uh, mentorship. It can be uh, like internal, so within the organization, or maybe it can be like uh, external educational programs. So that's in terms of more uh, uh, individual contributors. For managers, we have uh, internal leadership programs. I'm not sure if it's uh, relevant to, uh, to, uh, to this topic. Uh, it takes a bit of time, so it's a six months program, so which helps uh, managers to change their behavioral um, uh, patterns. Um, so I think that is probably a um, similar approach should be applicable to the individual contributors as well in terms of uh, progressing from mid level to senior level. It just takes time. That's from my perspective, um, does anyone else have any concluding thoughts before we wrap this up? I, I, one thought is, and just to go back to the word I've used several times, is it's so interesting to see the the the, the last five years, if we take a, a bit of a historical view, that the skill sets that you are all requiring in 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 the games world is actually beginning increasing to merge with what's in the screen world. And actually, one area for future conversation is is how do we how do our courses begin to prepare students for working in, across? I mean, there there will always be areas of separation, but a lot of the things are merging. So, how do we think about when we're identifying talent that you know people who are coming from areas that we might not have historically thought of because they're entering into a convergent industries? And that's that's the that's the big question I leave with, anyways. <laughs> I think that Very true. Hmm. And, and if I can just uh, I, I sort of answer some of that, I, I think um, from a point of view of, of what we're trying to do is that it's it's industry and educator involvement as opposed to industry and student involvement. And so I think that from a from a, mm. the way that those frameworks are set up in terms of education, of just getting out there and going, look, things have changed a little bit, and 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 we're happy to yeah. to, to show you what that change is and and work with yeah. you to to a little be more agile to meet that change. Yeah, I, I agree with that as well, Reese. that sentiment. Um, and that's something we, we're doing now more in, in partnership um, to say, yep, this, this, is, this is kind of what we need um, and working more. And as you say, putting ourselves forward that we are an industry partner um, for Capstone events, you know, no longer going along just seeing the outcome, but actually putting, oh, you know, getting involved and putting ourselves forward. Um, it's really important to see ourselves as a player you know in that role um to assist so yeah i agree i might i might just jump in and say i mean what like you know just recently what we've been doing is a lot of digital drop-ins with high schools um there was something about engineers and you know just talking to the students directly about you know what it's taken to get here and and exactly like you know what are the opportunities you can you can do with that with that degree or study um, but also we've been contacted by, um, by the education industry about what they need to do in their program. So that's already just starting now. So that's pretty exciting um, breakthroughs for us, I think. Excellent. Well, I'm glad to hear it. And so, um, look, I hope that the discussion here has served mm -hmm. as um, offered some inspirational examples that other studios can potentially emulate. So uh, thank you very much, Reese, David, Sarah, Caddy, and Lana. Thank you for making yourself available. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you.